Hello, we're two sisters, Britt and Alyssa, and we have watched the Hallmark Cinema made-for-TV special, The Tenth Kingdom, every year since its debut. With over 20 years of multiple viewings, we thought we'd share our odd obsession with you. Join us as we overanalyze this little blip of TV history. Well, I'm recording okay. now, so deal with it. Oh, great. I still have food in my mouth. Perfect timing. Do, 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 do. All right. <laughs> intro music. Intro music. <laughs> All right. So we're on to the second episode of The Tenth Kingdom, the 2000 classic Hallmark cinema movie. And I still can't get over that it's a Hallmark movie. I love it. I t- I'm telling you, I want to do all of the Hallmark entertainment movies. There are so many that you could cover. Oh, man, it's going to be good. Also, just like a plethora of genres. Like Exactly. There are talking dinosaurs in one of them. Oh, what? Yeah. Dinotopia, man. Dinotopia? And then here's here. You have the Gilmore Girls theory. I have the Jurassic Park theory. Because Sam O'Neill is also in Merlin, one of the first movies that they did. Mm-hmm. And he's he's the doctor in Jurassic Park. And then they also do Dinotopia. I don't think he's in that one, though. But this is clearly oh. the precursor. I'm going to need you to just very quickly explain what is Dinotopia. I'm going to Google it. At the same time. Oh, man, you never read this book? So it's like no. a, a kid's book where if dinosaurs and humans lived side by side and they visit this magical world where dinosaurs and people live side by side. Uh, also, some of the dinosaurs can talk for some reason and they're perfectly Only fine so. with the other dinosaurs being like enslaved. Now, this is not related to the Tenth Kingdom in any way, as Dinotopia definitely is related to the Tenth Kingdom. But do you remember (laughs) the Whoopi Goldberg movie where she had a dinosaur for her cop partner? No, and I'm going to start digging that up. It was called Theodore Rex. Theodore Rex. Uh, Theodore Rex, and it was bad. Oh, good. I'm going to I'm going to definitely watch that. Thank you for the suggestion. You're welcome. Anyway, that's our Dino Podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs> All right. So do you want to give the recap on what happened this episode? We'll, we'll okay. be a little bit more organized this time. What was the plot of this episode? Okay. So the main plot, well, it kind of diverges. Because at first, we're really still focused on getting out of the shitty situations, which we all found ourselves in at the end of the last episode. Oh, yeah. So there was a lot of wrap up. Yeah. Right. There was a lot of wrap up that needed to happen, which I'm glad that they don't end every episode with. Here's how we got out of trouble. We're Mm -hmm. really, I mean, it's a journey. We're really going through it. So Tony is still in prison. Um, Virginia is captured by the trolls. Yeah. Yes. Virginia's still with the trolls, and Wolf is with Virginia. We see this pretty much at the beginning of the episode. He comes in and saves her from the trolls. Well, you know, she essentially didn't truly get saved as much as he distracted the trolls. They punched each other in the faces and passed out, and then he was able to help her free herself. So we'll say it that way instead of... It, I mean, it was, was a fully a, developed like, plan by him. Like, he knew they would fight over this box of what smelled like leather shoes. That's true. I'm just trying to keep Virginia from falling into the trope of the poor damsel in distress. But you know what? It's a little fitting. It is a little. And you know what? She's the type that she would fight against that trope. But in this instance, she literally cannot help herself. So I'm I'm willing to give her a pass for that. She's not the damsel in distress so much as she was backed into a corner. Mm-hmm. I will say overall, the plot of this episode is not easy to pinpoint, but we're really just on foot. We're in the journey right now. Like they are moving. They barely get any rest. You really see how tiring this adventure is going to be. We're I like this episode a lot we're building up we're setting the story we're learning more about magic and we're like figuring out the world as a whole oh for sure so all right let's back up a little bit let's give an actual summary this time and be human beings who pretend like people have not seen this 
Uh, so Tony's in the prison. Virginia's captured by the trolls. And Wolf swings in. Freezer, after the trolls fight each other and knock each other out. Freezer, um, they run off into the bean forest. But not after she steals the magic magic shoes from Relish the Troll King. Uh, they were just oh, and same, I yeah they were in that same room where like somehow they've been on African safari, right? <laughs> I I have a correction from there were the like last episode. Leather, there were like leopard pelts everywhere in there. I was like, huh? They have yes, I there. for one, the troll palace is beautiful. I don't think anybody would debate that. Um, I do. I have to do a corrections moment. So I said last episode that the fourth kingdom planted the beanstalks and we knew that I was wrong. They actually explain it in this one. The third kingdom was given to the trolls yeah. because it was already polluted beanstalk yes. land where they could not grow anything. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I the blame is still on the fourth kingdom. <laughs> Oh, but yeah. in a different manner. They did not salt the earth, as I said before. The beanstalks were growing there already with giants inhabiting them. And then this land was given to the trolls. They were kicked out of the fourth kingdom mm -hmm. um, because they look ugly. We are never told why. They're very violent, but that per, I mean, that we can make an assumption that they probably wanted a lot more land than they were trying to do a takeover it, it constantly, was definitely... like they are. It was definitely a situation where they were like, fine, we'll give them this shitty little swatch of land and they'll leave us alone because they'll have their own kingdom, quote unquote. Right. And it's a big one, but there's like nothing there and you Meanwhile, can't grow Jack anything. Meanwhile, Beanstalk is like, I'm going to yeet off the map back into the fourth kingdom and that's where Beantown is. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, Jack and the Beanstalk um, clearly <laughs> did... Nothing, because by the end of his real story that we know, he has chopped down the beanstalk, thus the giant is not able to climb down the beanstalk, or he falls off and dies. I can't remember, but like either way. It really tapered at the top. Like, maybe it's, maybe none of them have, like, grown up enough since then to reach the giants. Well, so. And the giants so, can't climb down them. My point being, Jack uh -huh. cut down the beanstalk to well i think save himself not necessarily the land he was saving his own ass okay. and thus created a whole forest of beanstalks because no one ever bothered to pick up the dead pieces that were spewing seeds everywhere of the original beanstalk and now he is the creator of this land that nobody but the giants can use which i feel like jack would not have wanted <laughs> so right. he did a bad bad job is where I'm going. Hold and the second. land is I'm polluted and my, ugly. I'm going to move my microphone because it is picking up my computer's noise. Uh, yes. So, oh, the other thing is we see Jack. We see a facsimile of Jack. The uh, the statue of him is holding the magic axe. I called it. Oh, he is. You're right. I didn't even notice. Yeah. So he's holding oh, the magic great. axe in that. And he clearly, like, chopped down the beanstalk. And went off to Beantown. I will say we get a little foreshadowing in episode one. We get so much more in this episode. They're telling us next episode this is going to happen, basically. And I love it. I like the little bits of, by the way, this is what's going to happen. Right? <laughs> I'm all about it. Okay, so where we get Virginia and Wolf in the woods, they are running actively from the trolls it turns out virginia has stolen the invisible slippers that yes. the troll king loves like so no one's happy about on that his side yeah he probably would have stayed on his side of the river if it hadn't been for those shoes yeah, right well they still would have been chasing her because the kids would have because we also learn in this episode that dad has decided, the troll king, has decided to not wait for his reward from the evil queen. He's going to take what he wants right now. Yeah. So, so he is ooh, invading. So this, this is actually the first scene of the show. Um, the queen is, has dug up her mirrors and she's gotten her powers back. And she immediately can flash into the minds of like Relish and Wolf and just kind of like force them to go get a mirror and talk to her, which is really, really a cool power. 
we learn that it's very painful for them. They have yeah, to they do get it. A splitting headache until they get that mirror or some sort of reflective surface. But, you know, for some reason, she doesn't, either she doesn't do it a lot to Wolf, or he's, they go into this later in the episode, he's very protected from this, because it only happens to him twice, I believe. Right, and, and he doesn't get the headache. And he doesn't get the headache. Well, the second time, he's having a pretty bad time, but we'll get there next episode. This time, he really just, it was happenstance, he happened to be in front of a mirror, and she caught him alone, so she was able to see him. Yeah. Yeah, so she makes a communication like, hey, I can't see your traveling companions. What's up? And he's like, I'm not doing anything with you anymore. I quit. And she's like, you can't do that. I'll see you later. Wolf has made it very clear that he does not want any part of the bargain they originally made. He is being genuine with Virginia and Tony. He is Mm -hmm. genuinely trying to get them back to their mirror, which we have now... That is now the driving point of the story. Yes. So it's them getting the home. Yes, they've broken out of the prison. Acorn took the barge that had the mirror on it. So now they're trying to chase down Acorn. They're on the river. And they're still kind of like taking a little breath while they're chasing this dwarf with the magic mirror. Uh, meanwhile, the, the evil queen is at her castle. And it happens to be along this river. Uh... At the castle, she's training Wendell the dog in Prince Wendell's body how to behave like a human being. And it's my favorite line. I say it every single time we're at the dinner table and I'm eating dinner. She, so she's training the dog with the fork and the knife. And she's like, you're going to have a lovely meal just as soon as you can use a fork and a knife. And she's setting him up all pretty like that. And she goes... Will you require anything else? And he goes, my woolly ball. And she goes, we don't play at the ball. We don't play ball at the table. He says it so matter of factly. It's, yes, he says, please. <laughs> like, he's really trying. Oh, and like, then he, I have to say, this dog, this Prince Wendell dog so is working so hard to listen to his master. He is trying his best. He's never even been on his hinders before. He doesn't know how to well, do it. Well, he, he was standing before, but it was a little wobbly. He doesn't know he it can walk on It was very wobbly. Yes. <laughs> So we're getting from the root basics. Like, we are watching this unfold knowing it's not going to go great unless she has a lot of time. He is a dog. He There's nothing about him that says prince was ever a prince. I'm ready to be a prince. It says dog. Yep. <laughs> and he is, um, he doesn't know how to do anything. So it's very difficult for her, which I love to watch her struggle. But also... <laughs> She- Dog Wendell is so pure and so sweet. He's never a villain, uh, uh, ever. I no. love him. No, the second he sees, because uh, at one point, uh, Prince Wendell in dog form breaks away from the boat and goes swimming toward the castle because he feels himself. And he goes running toward it. And they happen to catch each other through this very narrow slit. And he's like, oh, oh, I want four legs, please. And, you know, Dog Wendell in human form, is so desperately trying to get back into being a dog dog. Yeah, he does not want to be human. There's no bone in his body that wants to be participating in the charade. He doesn't understand it, so he goes along with it because he doesn't want to get a newspaper to the back of the head. Mm -hmm. But he is a good boy. He's a good dog. And he's doing his best. (laughs) Who's a good boy? You're a good boy, Daniel (laughs) Lapain. Oh, and I'll say, in this scene... We get our first introduction to the Huntsman, and it's directly with the Evil Queen. And as in, oops, there's my real dog, Randy. No, we don't play. And as in the the traditional Snow White story, the Queen and the Huntsman seem to have a thing. They do. It's made pretty clear right away. He kisses her hand goodbye. She holds it to her face. It's very like pseudo sexual, which is amazing. Mm Mm-hmm. And the Huntsman I, is Rutger Hauer. Yes, <gasps> thank you. So beautiful. Uh, and as you know, gorgeous. Rutger Hauer is from Blade Runner, the original movie, um, and Lady Hawk. Mm-hmm. I like to imagine that 
you know, he and Lady Hawk married, Michelle Pfeiffer married, and had their child, and then the queen approached and told him to kill his own child, and this is all the same universe. Michelle Pfeiffer's baby. Michelle Pfeiffer's <gasps> baby. R.I.P. We don't he know that story. Lady Hawk. He killed Baby Hawk. You're getting you're getting ahead of yourself. All I'm we know about him myself. so far. All we know about him so far is that the queen is positive that the troll children will not catch Virginia and Wolf wrong. and Tony. She is not wrong. She's not wrong. They're never going to find that dog. That's They're not she even chose Wolf to begin with. Though it's like Plan B. <laughs> right. So now she's They're got a plan. They're already chasing C. him down the hall, and she's like Plan B. <laughs> Right. Just it was case. immediate. Yeah, that wasn't going to work out. And so, okay, we should rewind a little bit. Virginia and Wolf are with Tony and the dog when they all come out of the prison. They've made it out of the Troll Kingdom. They went through the, the Beanstalk land. And then they made it back to the prison and escaped with Tony. So we've done all of that. But the queen at any point in this is not looking for Virginia and Tony. She does not know they exist. She no. is purely trying to find the dog that has Prince Wendell in it so that she can kill it or trap it or whatever keeps the magic going. Mm -hmm. We're not totally sure. So all of these people chasing the them. Yeah, I think she would have kept them alive. All of these people chasing them are really after Prince Wendell. But... But they, we don't really know that she, I mean, we know that she doesn't know who they are, but we don't know that there's going to be any kind of connection at this point in the story. Right. She just knows that they're traveling with a group of people. Um, she can't see them for some reason, but she can see Wolf and she can connect with Wolf. Right. And so now... We've seen her training dog Wendell to be a prince, which is not going great. We see that Wendell, the dog, is separated from the group. He jumped off the boat, swam over to his dog body, his human body. Mm -hmm. And together on the boat is Tony, Wolf, and Virginia. And Tony finds, randomly, they have chosen this boat that uh -huh. happens to have a golden fish in a tank, a gold not with river water. A goldfish. Yes, the, the magical gold river, gold gold river goldfish. goldfish, which is basically the King Midas story. Uh, basically, what you touch turns to gold. And, of course, Tony, being a greedy schlub who's so willing to believe in any magic and any gains, immediately puts his finger in this fish and... It takes Tony. They all, so they, they all find the fish there together. Scenes. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it takes Tony two seconds. They all decide together. Wolf even this says, is dangerous this magic. This is a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> We're not doing it. None of us are doing it. It's a bad idea. And this is also, Wolf has been a very good guide for them because he also he, yeah, earlier, just open. moments before, threw the invisible shoes off the side of the boat because virginia was obsessed she was getting them. addicted to magic and he even points out like magic is addicting you lose yourself to it it's very powerful so not 10 minutes later <laughs> tony is <laughs> wiggling his pinky finger around in that dumb fish and he sure enough gets the power to turn it's funny because he seems to understand right away that this will not last forever and he needs to be wise about his decision because right. he wants to find something big to turn, and then he knows that it's going to dwindle away. The power will leave him. Right. So and he even he's offers, like, careful. I could turn this boat into gold. And then, fortunately, Virginia's like, and then it would sink and we would drown. So don't do that. <laughs> and he's like, that finally, a little, little bit of wisdom cracks through his skull and he goes, okay, I'll keep my finger in the air and not touch anything and not turn anything to gold. Good call. He's he can learn so soon. He's doing his best. Now we get to shore. <laughs> and I'm not sure. I, maybe I wasn't paying attention. How did the trolls catch up to Dog Wendell? So they were already rowing on the river. Uh, they stole mm -hmm. that rowboat instead of one of the steam-powered barges that were all aligned there. Anyways, they stole the rowboat. They trolls were rowing can't the do night. boats. They see the castle and they go, oh, let's check in with the queen. And she goes, where's the dog? And they're like, oh, <laughs> right. And so she slaps them and sends them on their way. And they happen to see, like, 
I think they happen to see Wendell as he's going back to town to get Tony to help him reach his human body self. And they all meet in right. River Town and they're attacking this dog. And Tony, like, bless his heart, he's like, he's just a little dog, leave him alone. And then he runs in and he comes up next scene and goes, Great news, I've defeated the trolls. <laughs> and he has. The trolls are turned to gold, but so is Prince Wendell. So this is, this we is, get... This is true Midas curse, too. Like, the second Midas touches his daughter, he regrets everything and the curse is lifted. Like, mm-hmm. unfortunately, Tony doesn't really learn his lesson in regret yet, so <laughs> everything I, stays gold. I would like to go through with you what I believe is the turning point of the show. I think once Wendell is gold, we really start to see, especially in the next, in the coming episode, we really start to see a side of Tony yeah. that is incredibly good. He, he feels is guilty. so, yeah, he feels so guilty. He feels, he's so loving. And yes, they're still focused on finding the mirror and traveling back to their time. But he is very genuine in making sure that Wendell is safe, that he's doing okay. Shortly after they've detached Wendell, and they, I guess, just leave the giant chunk of troll (laughs) gold. They do. They leave it there. So they have detached Wendell. He's made, like, a little pulley system for him. And they're in, they're now walking through the forest. They've learned that Acorn, the dwarf, took a bunch of the stuff from the barge he was on and was preparing to trade it in the next town. So they're walking through an enchanted forest. They know yes. the forest is enchanted. That's what it's called. And we get my one of my very favorite things when people eat in TV shows or movies. <laughs> I love it. And they are eating bacon sandwiches. And well, there's a and very that, earnest. Yeah, he's staring at the dog this whole time like, I've right. done this. And there's a very earnest moment where he, where Wolf says, he makes a little joke about like playing fetch with the dog to test <laughs> and see if he will come back from being gold. And Tony looks so hurt in that moment <laughs> that you just know we've the, completely turned a page. And fetch. And he's like, no. He's like, it'll be and funny if we the way that he it. believes, <laughs> yeah, the way that he believes the magic for just a moment where he's like, really? <laughs> Where he's like, everything usually works out around here. And Tony goes, really? Or are you just saying that? And Wolf goes, well, I'm just saying that. (laughs) He's so so sad. I'm also going to point out, like, Wolf even says, like, let's bury him and come back in the future. And he's like, no, I did this. I got him into trouble. I have to make sure he gets out of it. Like, Tony, that's why you were a good parent this whole time. Like, It's very good. Yeah. Okay. So then we meet the gypsies. Yes. Oh. oh boy. So I'm I'm going to I'm going to do the fantasy rule here like dwarfs are not little people, little people are human beings. I'm going to say these are magical people. They are not in any way affiliated with the Romani who are an actual ethnic group. <laughs> okay. So not not to label anyone as an actual gypsy. These are purely fantastical creatures. Yeah, they are able not to catch magic birds. They're able right. to actually put curses and, you know, use magic. And they're actually really hospitable until Virginia screws up. Okay, so I want to talk about that for a minute. What? Okay. okay One, we begin. get the gypsies. We get the introduction to them. They're kind of in the woods and they kind of jump out at the gang that we are following. And they immediately, there's a hospitality happening that is so immediate that I... I want to compare it to the movies Ever After, which are Barrymore, which I did talk about last episode <laughs> and I will be talking about in the future. So in Drew Barrymore's Ever After, they we also meet a gang of gypsies and who are very, like, they're very hospitable. They become a, friends. They kidnap a lady in her underwear. Go on. They do kidnap a lady in her underwear. Here's the thing, though. She makes them laugh and proves her strength and that's that is what makes them like her this gang that we are watching in the 10th kingdom did nothing and the gypsies were nothing but kind 
Exactly. They did not have to prove anything. Well, Wolf Tony like, did have to prove through song <laughs> that he was a Which, member. Let, let's take a moment to appreciate that they don't even go to the other members of their group when Tony's like, oh, no, I'm not a singer. I'm not a dancer. And they just they stay on Tony. They're not like maybe Virginia will sing. They're just like, no, we want a song from you, fat man. We want to hear it. We want to hear it from you. You're the one who ate the hedgehog. Sing. Yeah. And what is it, Dick? Gypsies Transcends by, by Cher. Cher. <laughs> the Which traveling people amazing. song. Oh, God. Okay, and it's so nothing that's not offensive. It, it's so offensive that they even let them just like sit there in that awkward, terrible silence. It's <laughs> like good on the good on them for being like, no, he's yeah, this is bad. It's kind of funnier. Well, it's the only reason it is funny is because they let them be like, what is wrong with you? what is going why why did you choose this why are we listening i love it and they are so like that this night looks fun let's be real yeah. they are up all evening they're doing fortune telling like it's a fun free night no hedgehog. one is forcing them delicious yeah free, free food <laughs> i know which they all stick their noses up like real quick but come on these people have been generous with you exactly Okay, so here's my question for you. You're you're at the camp for that night, and they go, mm -hmm. entertain us. Is our is our hospitality worth a song to you? What do you do? <laughs> okay, I if I were in their exact situation, I would probably tell a story. Like I think if Tony had told Ooh. the story about the magic bean, that would have been great. They would have loved it. They would have laughed at the idea of your boss kissing your ass. They're gypsies. Like they love that kind of shit, right? And oh, I, that's true. I think like, that would have been a big hit. Society on its ear, make this rich person kiss, kiss your butt. Yeah. Right. Oh, now, if I one. were me with my experiences, they would kill me and eat me because I have nothing interesting to do and no talent. So <laughs> that would be problematic for me. I think I would just start reciting plot lines from Game of Thrones or something. They've never seen it. Yeah, exactly. Why not? Ooh, <laughs> okay, I take it back. There's a town who doesn't like to dance and in comes Patrick Swayze. <laughs> Oh my god. Could you imagine if they or heard Kevin about a town Bacon. that didn't like dance? Oh, uh -huh. Okay. I take mine back. Yes, I would just tell them the plot of my favorite movie. You've got yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. There is a magical and they would cry. mail service that lights up a square and tells you if you've got a letter. And we'll call These the story two You've Got Letter. People destined to meet. But they've oh, never they seen each it. other's faces. They only know each other by a pen name. Oh, it's, you know, tell us all this time. Yep. And based off shop around also, the corner, which it was real. Also in New York City and Seattle. And maybe they live on a houseboat or in New York City. Right. I would just smash those two movies mm -hmm. right together. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I'd go the route of telling a story too. Yeah, I think it, you can't go wrong. It's always interesting. You can make it interesting. Even now, if, if they terrible, need a song. Like, really? If they need a song, I'm singing Lady Gaga. <laughs> pa 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 poker face, pa pa poker face. Because you can't tell me that they wouldn't one thoroughly enjoy my rendition of Jolene, but two find that song <laughs> in by your ring. They would love it. Oh man, that'd be a good one. <laughs> okay. So the gypsies have been nothing but nice. We wake up the next morning and obviously Wolf and Tony and Virginia want to get going before the gypsies are awake. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting way ahead of myself. Yes, we should talk about the fortune telling. There's a fortune teller and she is very intense. Again, the old ladies in this movie are beautiful, wonderful, amazing, intense actresses. Yes. Ooh, oh, gosh. This woman. I don't she know who she is. She stares Ugh. down cynical Virginia and goes, I'm going to read your fortune. And Virginia obeys. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. Like she never has before or exactly. since. Exactly. Like even oh. her cynicism is just cut short by this woman's intense gaze. Yes. So we get a fortune reading. She tells Virginia that she's very hurt 
by never knowing her mother, by her mother leaving when she was very young. Virginia has been known already to brush this off. Exactly. Like, she's like, whatever, people split up. Yeah, it's not a big deal to her. She doesn't see it as a big loss. It's, it's nothing for her. Which I will say, just because this is our podcast, I've always found this very relatable because I do not oh, feel yeah. like it was a big deal that I don't know my birth father. And I could care less what You're he's doing. He could be an one. Aspen for all I know. <laughs> you don't think he could be an Aspen, do you? <laughs> I don't think he is. But I do think that he's somewhere in Texas lying about being Hawaiian. So that's fun. And I've always found this extremely relatable in terms of story. But now watching it, well, I should say, because we watch it about every year. So it's not like I oh, haven't grown with it. Every this. year. Yes. yes. At least. I have found myself more and more relating to the people around her who are saying, this is a bigger deal than you give it credit for. And you should and you feel hurt. Don't, yeah, you don't miss it. You don't think about it because it's. It's not a thing. And then some someday, like, you're watching your own husband and your kid and you're like, oh, oh, I get it. Yeah. And in a way, this is, I mean, we, this show is fun and stupid and funny, but this is a very true, the way that they've written her storyline with her mother specifically, it's a very real feeling character. And I love that. Yeah. And honestly, she's, she's pulling it off, man. Like, even for oh, like, a late 90s actress, you, you kind of like expect a little bit of camp in there. But she's cynical and she slowly breaks down those layers. And after a while, she is kind of charmed by the world around her. She is excited. They they run to a cottage in the middle of, in the, middle of the woods while they're trying to escape um, while it's raining. And they go, where are we going to find someplace in the woods? And a cottage appears. And she starts piecing together, oh my gosh, this is Snow White's cottage. And, you know, actually, to Tony's credit, he figures it out first. Good on you, Tony. But she gets, like, charmed by this. She's in love with the whole, oh, we're actually in a fairy tale. It's real to her. I then. think, yeah, I think there was a bit when they're looking at the map where she's like, okay, these are, how did, what does he say? The seven women who? The five women who changed five. history. Okay. Do you, re- do you remember which five? I love Cinderella. The you list things. Yes. Snow Cinderella, White. Snow White. Gretel. Gretel the Great. Gretel the Great. Is there Little Red Riding Hood? Yes. Oh, okay. Red Riding Hood. You're very oh, close. Sleeping Beauty. No. Rapunzel. Ooh. Rapunzel oh my god yes, that's right okay and we go through all the, the stories at that point yeah yes okay all right so to rewind a little bit she gets this fortune reading and she's very not happy with whatever is happening it's a very intense reading where somebody's telling her emotions that she should feel she does not want to feel them she basically runs away and wolf very excitedly comes up for his reading next because he wants to hear about his love life at this point in the story he is so in love with virginia and i cannot with him anymore he is so cute and i love him i'm gonna remind you at this point before you say anything else you only have one gilmore point per episode are you gonna use it on a scott cohen reference because i cannot okay i'd like to use it right now okay Okay. when (laughs) in gilmore girls when Scott Cohen proposes, he's playing the character of Max, uh, when he proposes, he sends Lorelai a thousand yellow daisies. And that is just such a wolf thing to do. And in the show, they're being completely unrealistic. There's like a bazillion daisies. Like, yeah, this, you go this into one shop 1, and go, do you have like two dozen roses? And they're like, we have like uh, six. Right, six, just six, right. <laughs> so, you have this Orcus filius, this magical, beautiful, rare flower of course not right so scott cohen he has found a billion flowers and i should say this is the very end of season one this is the we she walks into her workplace it is filled to the brim with daisies just as he had mentioned when he wanted to propose it's the sweetest moment in the show and then it's the end of the season, so we don't even know if she said yes. And chances are, it's Lorelai Gilmore. She will probably say no. We don't know. So anyway, it's a very romantic gesture. It's very wolf-esque. 
And the wolf that I'm getting right now is that same peak Max character. Nothing but loving. He just, he is very honestly there for Virginia. He is trying to woo her, but he's, I don't think, coming on too strong. He's still really teaching her and showing them, her and Tony, about the land, and he's bonding with them. And I love that. Well, okay, so I, I will say he came on way too strong. He's yes. very in your face at first. Uh, but they do make a point of he's been reading these self-help books. He's been going mm-hmm. through his mantras every day. He's very importantly, the books tell him to talk about his feelings and to be more open and honest. And he starts trying to show Virginia things about his world like he describes the night of all the animals parading around oh. and he, she starts to get a little charmed by that because he's being a very an genuine eye. honest person and that, that was not like guiles or tricks he's just he's finally being himself and being comfortable with himself that conversation is when i think as a viewer you are meant to fall in love with wolf he is so passionate about the night and about what was happening and he describes it in such a way he's a total romantic and he scott cohen has played this character perfectly but and here's my point is like up until then he wasn't really comfortable with being a wolf he always kind of hid that part of himself and then here he's like you know what i'll share a little bit of my world with her and that's when you start to see okay he's not bad no and it's funny the transition that they are yeah. able to make with him from being a literal servant of the evil figure in the show the yeah. evil queen he is her servant he is bound to her and yet we so easily believe so quickly we're in episode two that he has already completely transformed he is definitely not loyal to the queen he's he's not lying to her and saying he is we are full force ahead he is here to help these people he i don't even think he knows why at this point he has to help them because of his love for Virginia. Because he feels he such a bond to her. her. Yes, he did. Like Let's bring it back to Twilight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Jacob did it on a baby, which is not ever appropriate. Oh. And I will never hear any other side to that argument. No, no, no. He's, it's trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning. He's grooming a child. Yeah. So it's not good. Wolf oh. is not doing that. <laughs> He has imprinted on Virginia, but they are both grown consenting adults. (laughs) I brought it up. I'm sorry. It's disgusting. But it is very similar. And I don't know if that's a trope that's older. Obviously, it's older than Twilight. But I didn't know that that was a... Is that like a classic fairy tale? Well, a wolf... You know how vampires can't see themselves in mirrors? Like, that's a classic. What would you call that? It's a trope for sure, but it's actually um, a wolf is known as a salacious person, uh, kind of a lustful person. Right. So that's the double entendre that they're playing with is like, oh, he's a wolf. He's a, a little. He's, a, he's always like sexually driven. You. Yeah. 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 He's a okay. rust about. He's a rake. He's a rake. How old are you? <laughs> a thousand Okay, so we get Wolf's um, fortune telling, and he is only interested in the love aspect of his fortune, but right away, crazy-eyed gypsy woman has leaned into him and said he's very dangerous. She sees him burning at the stake. She sees the dead young woman. He, I think, immediately assumes that it's going to be Virginia, but that's not said. And then she says, because you're a wolf. And he says, so is your grandson, who is right behind them in the scene. It's actually like we've talked about before. Yeah, it's a great cinematic shot, which a lot of this show is known for. They have beautiful shots. They have very well-staged shots. They knew, like, we can't show the cardboard that's behind this gold seal, quote unquote. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) They knew how to position their people. It's pretty good. They really did, like, knock it out of the park. Cinematography-wise, this is a good show. So that is the tipping point that she laughs. She loves that he came back at her with that. And they are welcome at this point to stay the night. They've really made friends with these gypsies. God knows why. No, I think there was a lot of like respect for each other. Like, okay, you played by our rules and you still respected us. Right. You can stay. 
And then now we've caught up to what I was saying before. It's the next morning. And Virginia does the best slash worst thing she's going oh. to do throughout the entire show. The most. I get the Because feeling if she hadn't have done had, it. I, I get the feeling she wouldn't have had to do it if she had just obeyed the rules. <laughs> but go on. You know. Okay. I like this argument. Let's talk about it. Okay. Yeah. So she frees. They earlier in the night, they see these birds that talk like people and it really pulls at Virginia's heartstrings because Wolf says they sell the gypsies, sell them, they catch them and sell them. And then their wings are ground up and rich people buy it. Whatever. And they eat the birds thinking right. they'll get the magic. Yeah. Right. And so as they are leaving the camp in the morning before the gypsies are awake, Virginia frees all of the birds and one of the cages gets knocked over and the gypsies wake up. So they see that it was her. They know it was them. Help us. Help us, please. You do say they're little victims. Which little is, victims. how could you not help them? We're just little birds. They literally say little victims, which is the saddest thing I've ever heard a finch say. It's, it's so, true. I would, I would free the birds. I, I will admit, I would free those birds, period. It Sorry. would be hard not to, but it gets them in a lot of trouble. So as they are running off, we see that there's not really like a huge chase after them. Yeah. Instead. The, the fortune teller calls them off. She's like, come back, right. come back. We're, leave it. And then she casts a spell on Virginia with the hair that she had taken the night before. And again, this actress with the crazy intense eyes. Oof. Great. Okay. She's killing it. So we don't exactly know what the spell is going to do, but she mentions a lot about making her hair really hurt and grow, and it's going to, she's going to want to kill herself, basically. It's going to be a nightmare for her. I know why she's wearing that terrible wig in the early episode. Oh my God. Can we talk about the wig <laughs> budget on this oh, show? It was I saw $15. Wig tape everywhere. There was wig tape everywhere in the beanstalk forest. Just. Just keep an eye on her hairline. It goes everywhere. The wig budget here. So one, they bought all the trolls wigs and then they said, whatever doesn't work on the trolls, we'll just comb out and reuse for everyone else. Because <laughs> it is a mess and a nightmare. Nothing is done right. The little oh, baby hair terrible. that they have pulled away from her head in the beginning. Yikes. Why didn't they wait to cut her actual hair? Or did she come in with short hair? Yeah, and if and if she did, like, then put the wig on her when she's cursed, like, it was terrible. It was anyway, yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now there's a big run through the forest. Oh, we should mention. At some point, they were told before they met the gypsies, they were told to stay off the main road by again an old traveling wise woman who was a great actress. I think that's um, Snow White in disguise. Oh. So we get what could possibly be Snow White in disguise. We get a tiny learning moment. She teaches them a little something. Virginia gives her a sandwich. And she says, stay off the main road. Somebody is following you and he intends to kill you. And Wolf, knowing the land, says there is a huntsman who owns these woods. Mm -hmm. That must be who it is because he also works for the evil queen. Mm -hmm. And I guess he has worked for her since before she was in prison. It sounds like they've yes. known each other for a long time. Oh, yes. I so mean, they know this job, guy's on their so they, They've never, like, yeah, he keeps the poachers out. Keep him around. Keep him on the payroll. Oh, I sure as shit not poach in those woods. That guy will kill you. Yeah, keep him on the payroll. <laughs> and it's what? Rutger Hauer. Yeah, which his eyes are intensely Ooh, blue. And green. if he looked at you too wrong, you would die. Mm -hmm. For sure. R.I.P. By the way, he did die. I know that was so oh. sad. Anyway, I stood on the sands of the thousand miles away, gazed into the. Up up to him because he killed it in this show. He's so spooky, and they know. Anyway, they know he's after them, so they're running through the forest. Her hair is getting longer and longer by the moment, and they need to find a place to stay for the night. And she's a wreck. Virginia has. The longest hair you've she's ever seen. She's carrying it in her arms. It's trailing on the floor behind her. It's full of leaves. My nightmare. It's so dirty already. <laughs> and it has been 12 hours. And you can tell there's like split ends everywhere. Whoa. Oh, it's a nightmare. And so then they find the cottage you were talking about. It's Snow White's cottage, which is a very sweet scene. They even talk about Love Prince. It. 
Prince is the direct descendant of He's Snow the White. grandson of Snow White, mm -hmm. yeah. So Snow White was not lucky enough to live as long as Cinderella, I guess. She did not have that type of magic because she is dead. But, oh, wait. No. Okay, we learn later what how she died, actually, which is strange. After she had a family. I don't really know how that timeline goes. Well, I think she just... I think she just passed away of old age. Like, she just aged gracefully and saw her great family and departed. Maybe. Maybe she was just ready. She didn't want to hang around like she Cinderella. She really wasn't an angry ghost. You know, like, she, she was at peace with where she was. That's true. Well... So it, I found interesting about the cottage. There's a little throwaway line where Wolf says, this place has been lost to our people. Like, they have not found this cottage. Like, nobody knows how to get to it in these secret enchanted woods. Uh -huh. Which makes me think it appeared for them. Yeah. Right? I, I truly think that it did. I think mm, there's other things later that happened. But yes, it truly found its way to them. Also, there was, like, troll graffiti everywhere about how elves suck. and Yeah, so it's appeared for other people as well <laughs> in their assume, hour of need, in their hour where they of then need, vandalized it. <laughs> the trolls were fleeing to the border as refugees, and in their hour of need, this cottage appeared so that they'd be safe from the huntsmen, and they vandalized it. Okay, and simultaneously, we are getting a little update on the gypsies, which isn't going great for them. No, they did. The huntsman kills them all, which... They shot through the heart, and you're I, to blame. I guess because they're poachers? They, I don't know, he's poaching. merciless. They're poaching on this, like, you gotta remember, especially in medieval times, forests were the property of the lord in the area. And you were poaching if you went out to go kill a deer that's just, like, wild and running around. You kill that deer, bring it home to your family and eat it, you're a poacher. Like the Hunger Games. Exactly like the Hunger Games. They don't want you to do it for yourself. They want you to rely on the man. Exactly. Oh, my God. These people are entrenched yep. in tyranny. And they stood up and went, you know what? The deer do not belong to you. We're going to eat the deer. And the huntsman went, fine. Boom. So he killed them all. Which is a very, actually very terrible scene. Because they're like the only friends that these people have made. Except for Wolf. Running through this kingdom. And they're all dead. So things aren't looking great for the group. And Virginia's got tons of hair. So that hair. she cannot do anything with they're trying to cut it in the morning nothing is working she's just got to carry it around it is magic and they hear from one of the birds right yes that there's a magic axe in the forest that can be used to cut her hair the bird says once swung it never misses and it cuts what it intends to cut or whatever yeah so that is our next tiny side journey. We need to find that axe. Yep. They need but to find a blind woodsman. Is... Blind woodsman. Oh, yeah. Yes. They know he's blind. Okay. I d Wait, do they know he's blind? Yeah. She says there's, okay. a, there's a, a blind woodsman who has a magic axe. That one swung okay, will okay. never fail to cut through what it's swung at. Okay. But in the Which immediate... I, again, I posit, this is Jack the Beanstalk's magic axe. But go on. How do you think this guy got it? I don't know. We don't know him yet. I'm sorry. He's not to the next episode. Let's talk about that next time. I don't know. Okay. So in the immediate time being, they cannot look for that axe because they know the huntsman is right on their tail. And they all need to figure out a way to hide from him. So Wolf helps them destroy their scent and he buries virginia and tony and the golden wendell in the ground mm -hmm. and says he will come back for them later and i i believe tony in a moment of are we sure he's even going to come back is really putting a lot of trust on wolf right now he really is he goes from not trusting wolf at all to okay hide us 
Mm-hmm. Well, Wolf has been very loyal to He's them in this short the amount of time. Days, yeah. So immediately they get caught <laughs> because the huntsman is right overhead and Virginia sneezes or Tony sneezes. Virginia sneezes. She screws it up. Yes, it's a bummer. And as she's running away, he doesn't even run. He just steps on her hair. <laughs> So here's where your point earlier that I think you were about to make comes in. She would not have been caught had she not let the birds go. So then they would not have needed the birds at all. At all. Because the birds really only help with things that she made herself a problem for already. Uh Uh-huh. And they, okay. even put, they even put, like, a limit. We find out later. They're like, you're such a lot of trouble, Jesus. They're like, we've already helped you so much. <laughs> you, you have to like stop. of us. We can't be helping you on this entire journey. They were like, we live in the woods. We're not following you elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, Although, to the, be fair, like, good deed for good deed. She did do it out of the kindness of her heart. I would free the damn birds. She, I admit it, but... Yeah, she wouldn't have would free, needed that. They wouldn't have needed their help at all, but they did help, and it's very nice. Okay, so Virginia is now being brought Tony, the gold dog, the gold Wendell, and Wolf are have gotten away, but Virginia has been captured. So, so for the Wendell is on. still buried. They, oh, that's yeah, right. they leave they leave Wendell buried until they can get Virginia back. Okay, I forgot. He's still on the ground. Yeah. Okay. Which cracks me up because, like, so, hmm. At one point it said you were dragging something on a cart, but the weight was too heavy for just that of a dog. But we see Tony, like, lifting this thing up, wheeling it around. A golden retriever is 75 pounds. Oh. And he lifts it up. And that's not covered in gold, by the way. A gold golden retriever would weigh significantly more. Hmm. Like a, a little slice. Pounds. Yeah, a little slice of gold, about one ounce, or like a kilogram of gold is about the size of a cell phone. It's really like dense and heavy. And, you know, there's got to be at least a kilogram covering this dog. Like, I will say, we learn later on that it's more of a gold dust. Gold egg. shell, yeah. Like a golden leaf, possibly even. It is not thick. But he still, and it doesn't take a lot. So he still swings around this 75-pound dog. Yeah, that is impressive. You know, Tony's <laughs> Maybe a strong he's man. Maybe not that. He, he's like pure muscle under there. We just never see him he's without a his shirt. Man. Yeah, he, he never, we never see him without his shirt. Maybe he's just pure roided out muscle. Hey, tell, I mean, let's, we, let's make it canon now that Tony is actually very incredibly strong. Yes, um, he but he does not use Hulk. this ability ever for anything useful. <laughs> Ever. He, he's the Incredible Hulk. Right. Able to lift golden dogs. At ease. At ease. With ease. With incredible ease. Is that the end of the episode? We see that her is. going into the tree. Yes. He. So the huntsman has her by the hair. He's pulling her through the woods. He punches this tree and it opens up and has like a magic door. And he pulls her inside and closes it. And that's the end of the episode. This episode is torture because all they've done is gone from being trapped to being trapped. And they're just walking around in between we getting get in trouble. Lot, we get a lot of exposition in this one, too, though, because we learn about the queen. We see her magic mirrors, which they make a specific point to show she has a traveling mirror. Yes. Yeah, that's like the last mirror she pulls up and they're like mirrors to rule the world. And it's like oh, traveling mirror. Yes. Okay. This is clean and new and so, shiny. I love this episode because we get a ton of lore and we get a lot of character building, which like we talked about Wolf is all extremely fun and good. Yeah. And I think this episode is honestly like this episode, like I said, with, with Tony turning a corner, it's very much that for almost every character. Virginia's yeah. becoming a little more loving. Wolf is very loyal. Tony is becoming a very good guardian and protector. So they're all kind of forming Even their Wendell roles. Wendell has a little bit of an arc because he decides to go back and get Tony and get help. Right. Whereas before, he'd probably just be like, I can handle this. He would have rushed right in and gotten himself trapped. Yep. 
Well, overall, 10 out of 10. This episode is great. First episode, also a 10 out of 10. The next Ooh, episode Russell, will also be a 10 out of 10. It, I'm going to have to give it a 14 out of 10 because I think the next episode is a 20 out of 10. The next episode. Oh, my God. Can we just dwell on it? So I'm not over-exaggerating. I want the world to know whoever listens to this podcast, the, the three of us that will listen to it, me, you, and Bobby, that <laughs> we cannot overstate how good this episode is. Oh, man. It so, is peak Tenth Kingdom material. This is the episode we're going to rope the husbands into, which oh, God, is yes. hilarious for me. Bobby has watched this with, with me before, like the whole set. And he started listening to the podcast, which, oh, thank you, sweetie. You're our number one fan. Uh, number one. Number one. Anyways, he listened to the episode and he was dying. He loved you. You were killing him. Anyways, <laughs> he started watching the episode with me and he started like pointing out small things too. It was great. It's so I can't know. wait. We're going to rope the husbands in on the next episode and we're going to like record what they're saying because <laughs> this is, we'll have special guests or at least I'll quote Bob because this is too much. I can't wait. And Tom has never seen it. I can't okay, so I should say that Tom has in passing, because obviously I've been married Through for nine osmosis, years. Everybody's watched it at least three times if they've known us. <laughs> yes. Now, the only people that I've ever made sit down and genuinely watch it with me were when I was 19 and I moved out for the first time and I had my roommates who are now my best friends, my girlfriends, but it was when I had first met them. This and I convenient. said, I said as a foolish young child, 19 year old. You know what would really tell these people about me, these strangers, is if I shared with them something that I love to do every year, which is watch The Tenth Kingdom. And it was around our annual viewing time, so I believe you were watching it, too, separately. Oh, I was, um, yes. Yeah. And so I turned it on and said to all the girls, gather around, new friends. Here's how you are going to get to know me. <laughs> and... They said, this is not a movie. It's eight hours long. And I said, oh, no, we will be watching it as a movie. End and they end. said, <laughs> 10 minutes in, they said, no, we will not be watching this as a movie. <laughs> and the only one who stuck around was my best friend, maid of honor, Rachel. <laughs> and That's she did watch the, the whole thing. Yeah. And to this day, still makes fun of me for it. Even Perfect. though she stuck around and watched... The entire thing. But it was out of a bribe because then I agreed to watch all of the Back to the Futures back to back Ooh. with her the that's, next day. You know, like she got off on this deal because that's that's a good deal. Um, I will I say, know. yeah, this is we're making a podcast about it. It's a silly movie. We've watched it for 20 years straight. Many times. I will never say this is the best movie ever. <laughs> it is oh, for some reason no. stuck in my brain as a part of my soul. No, that is exactly what I mean. A bad movie. <laughs> By me showing it to other well, people, I was not it's saying, okay yeah, I was not saying, here's this thing that I'm sure you'll enjoy. I was <laughs> saying, here's this piece of me. And after you see it, you will understand me a little and better. It wasn't in any form to say, here's this piece of media that I believe is universally enjoyed. <laughs> no. <laughs> Bobby would come home like, Every summer for like three years, because you lived right around the street from me, every summer for three years, at one point he would come home and we'd just be eating bacon sandwiches watching this eight hour long movie. Yes. <laughs> We've both been married a, a long time now at this point, and our spouses have grown accustomed to Is it the intro the playing yeah. and them leaving the room for the entire day. Uh-huh. They, they oh they don't have to like it but they do respect it and i respect them oh, for that there's never been pushback otherwise i would not be married <laughs> i think i would hide in a closet and watch it on one of those like portable 80s tvs you would never hide yourself in that way i would i love that. i brand this on my heart i would happily get a 10 kingdom tattoo Ooh, let's design a 10th kingdom tattoo for the end of this. Ooh, but to be fair, I would get a tattoo of We will get a 10th kingdom tattoo. <laughs> Ooh, okay. It would honestly take no, like one watch from Bobby and I'll get the tattoo. It doesn't matter for me, oh, okay. but for you, you should do that. No, I, I have like keloid scarring. 
it would not be pretty. Yeah, it's going to be 3D. Okay, but gonna you have to get great. troll toy tattooed on your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to round out the episode's end, as I talked last time about food and what I was going to be eating, I'd like to discuss our meals. So this time going in, you unfortunately were not able to match ahead. my yes. energy. And I, I ate a bacon food. sandwich as I was, well... I won't say it was right before we were recording. I did not eat it as I watched the episode because I watched the episode the other night. But going forward, I would like to make a meal per episode. And I'm quite quite the cook. So I mean a genuine, this is the dinner menu for that night of the week when you choose to watch this episode. This is your corresponding meal. So I will be doing that. Well, next week for you, then you have to make a full rack of lamb. Okay. Uh, complete or... roasted root vegetables and apple cider. Now they do eat shepherd's pie though, which you ate tonight, but I am happy to make in my home as well. Do you think because they eat shepherd's pie specifically that I should make that? Or do you think I should make rack of lamb and put I it on a beautiful serving tray? Pie. I see them eating a rack of lamb. Yeah, she said to... they were known for their shepherd's pie. No, no. You're trying to cheap out of this. It's a rack of lamb. Lamb. <laughs> oh, I thought that she said that they were like, that's what they their specialty was. No, no. They're like Is eating the bones and everything. Like, mm, Okay, okay, okay. No, I'll make a rack of lamb. That's fine. Although now um, I'm trying to like break my mind. Like, I know they I eat a ton they of mentioned. stuff because this whole town is like agrarian and it's very farm to table. I'm ready for the food. (laughs) I'm ready. Are you just hungry? Go eat some popcorn or something. You sound like you're hungry. No, I just say I'm very full. But I'm just excited because I love cooking. Okay, I am going to photograph it in a way that it looks just like Tony's table. And I have the perfect serving tray, which I'm very excited about. I'll post pictures. Don't worry. Ooh, please do. And include recipes. Well, oh, I'm going Kingdom to. Kingdom Cookbook, it'll sell tens. It'll, it'll sell at least two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Okay, so next week's menu. Oh, I'm going to watch the episode first, because if they do mention shepherd's pie, that's what I'm making. If not, I'll make rack of lamb, and I'll do it with a spread of uh, charcuterie like board, root- but with vegetables. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like the root vegetables are definitely a thing. Giant big old carrots. Yep. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to do all of that jazz. And this time I do want to eat it. Mm, I was going to say while I was watching the episode, but it has to tell me if there's shepherd's pie. Because if not, I really want to make <laughs> you that. You just heard me that I made shepherd's pie. Now you want that. Just make that because you want it. I know. I should just make it on a random night. But lamb shepherd's pie is so good. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll just do it anyway. Anyway, that's the idea for next week. So please, if you're listening along and watching along, also um, cook correspondingly. (laughs) Or just, you know, enjoy the episode. No, you have to be in theme. We have strict rules here. Okay, I'm sorry. Right. Also, I'd love to hear um, a dress-up suggestion, so like a cosplay. Love to hear it. Oh, if you no, have any, send like them our way. Corsets and slutty Bo Peep gear. Yes, exactly. Ugh. Oh, I, I can't, can't wait. wait. I love the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite episode. Do, 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 do.